OK, let's go to our panel discussion. So, panellists today, I'm in, pleased to introduce our Rob Ayres, Business Development of Bates Group. <laughs> now you can come, yes. Now, Rob Ayres is a 25-year payments uh, uh, expert. He's a veteran. Thank you for your service. It's not that kind of was, veteran. Was it World War II? <laughs> <laughs> oh, remittance veteran. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, boasting executive roles in license money, transmitters, global firms, startups, mergers and acquisitions. Okay. Founder of FinTech Advisor in 2016, guiding clients in payments and remittance, navigating licenses, regulatory programs and financial projections. Currently, Bob drives business development at the Bates Group, uh, the FinTech's compliance and licensing team. Let's hear it for Rob. <laughs> Lovely. Where's Jonathan Jensen? Jonathan, come to the stage, sir. JJ. Regulatory Policy Advisor at CBG and Vice Chairman of the Association of Document Validation Professionals. Jonathan holds two decades of expertise in the payments and identity sectors, covering digital identity, AML, digital money, consumer payments and telco billing. His current mission centres on navigating regulatory shifts in identity of money laundering, addressing the influence on financial crime. Do you get a chance to do anything else? I mean, it's kind of busy loads, day. Loads, loads. Do you play golf? I don't know. There you go. Something you to consider <laughs> if you have time, because that's that's a big yeah, resume. It is. Where is Ibrahim Muhammad? Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> now, Ibrahim, we met this lovely gent last year. Highly passionate payments professional. Twenty years of experience in money transfers. Provides specialised consultancy services to startups and incumbents. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. And Nadim Qureshi. Where is Nadim? CTO at USI Money. Uzi money. You can clap for him. It's, it's, it's allowed. It's good. He's a co-founder and chief technology officer of USI Money, fintech payment services provider. Nadim has developed a wealth of experience over his 18 years in the industry. You don't look that old. Working with both private and public companies, providing business support services across Europe and the Middle East. Great to have you here. Are we uh, missing one? No. No. Are we not? No. Okay. No worries. No one else is qualified. Oh, <laughs> terrible. Uh, I will be posing a question which is left field, so do prepare for that after that. Uh, again, over to you. Rob, thank you. thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I noticed more people left when they announced the group than came in, so let's, let's dazzle who's here, all right? So it's kind of interesting when Natalie asked me to moderate a panel on compliance. I'm a business development guy. I'm not a compliance guy. And how many, who is a business development or salesperson in the room? Yeah, okay. And are there any compliance people in the room? Right. So you all know that there's a natural tension between the sales business development piece and the compliance piece. We're the pro-business group. We used to call the compliance people the anti-business group. But I never said that, but some people did, just so you know. Um, so it's an interesting, but, but over time, what, what you realize, particularly as we're going to talk about today, the changes in, in compliance these days that are frequent and, and ongoing, is that you've got to be able to work together. So I've, over the years, I promise you, have developed a healthy respect for what compliance can do. It can not only keep the client out of trouble, it can keep me out of trouble. So uh, I do appreciate that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, clearly, I think the compliance people understand that you know, we're in the business to make money. So it's that balance that, that you have to strike. So with that, what, what I would tell you is that um, the questions that we have, um, some are aimed at each at a specific individual. Although I would tell you that if I'm asking Ibrahim a question, certainly Nadim and JJ could uh, could also answer. And then there's a couple of, of general questions. So I think we're going to jump right in, um, and we're going to start with Ibrahim. Uh, and so the question is. How has the landscape of compliance in payments and remittances evolved in recent years, and what are the key driving forces behind these changes? Compliance, uh, yeah, very interesting subject. Maybe to some of us it might be a boring subject as well, but uh, it is what it is, right? Uh, I will just share my experience first before getting into the, you know, the key factors driving the compliance uh, changes. Uh, when I started working in the mid-90s, uh, I'm not that old though, but I started working in mid-90s and I realized those days we didn't have any compliance team. Uh, so we were in, of course, uh, payments uh, services 
And at that time, I remember it was all about operations. So we had only front office and a back office, and these two departments only, you know. So everything was happening just between them. Customer serving uh, team was only the front office, the agents uh, catching to the customers, and the back office team used to take care of all the processing and heavy lifting. Uh, so there was nothing called compliance. And then, of course, with the time, you know, uh, with the increased regulatory uh, scrutiny, then, of course, companies realized that they need to have a compliance function. And that, I believe, came in the late 90s, early 2000, and especially before 9-11. And then 9-11 was a turning point, which is where everybody realized that compliance is now very crucial, and it has to be an independent function. So till that time, based on my own experience, it was all merged with back office, with operations. And uh, in fact, there was also a time where even the business development guys used to do a bit of compliance. You know, but then, of course, today, if you see, it's a clear segregation uh, between compliance and the back office. So a lot of changes have happened over the last few years. I mean, obviously, we know that technology is one key factor that's driving the changes within the compliance. Uh, the regulatory uh, changes that's coming, uh, that's another factor that's driving the compliance. And the third is the consumer expectations. Uh, so these three, in my views, are the main driving forces uh, that has changed the way we look at compliance today. Nadim or JJ, anything? Yeah, perhaps I can just add something. <clears throat> I guess for me, the, the big change over the past years has been the increasing focus on a risk-based approach yes. to managing this. So regulations have moved from being more prescriptive to being less prescriptive, yeah. putting the onus on the regulated firm to uh, take a view, which they need to be able to justify to their regulator, of course, as to what processes, checks, and so on, they, they should follow. Um, and that, you know, that direction's come from um, FATF right down and obviously finds its way into local legislation. Um, but yes, I think for me, that's, that's probably the key change. That's a good point. Nadim, anything? Uh, no, you don't have to. Sir, I actually agree with what the gents just said. Um, I actually agree with what they just said. Um, I think... Um, Sort of 2017, uh, we had the introduction of the payment services uh, regulation, um, and ever since then, 2018, 19, and then obviously with the arrival of the pandemic, um, there was a lot of shift um, in focus um, by the regulator, um, and that sort of uh, sure. brought into play um, the um, operational resilience programs, uh, which firms had to. Um, undertake. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I actually uh, think that um, it's an interesting landscape um, in, in terms of the way things are moving forward. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, there are certainly some similar, if you go across countries and regions, the regimes are never going to be identical. But uh, to JJ's point on risk-based uh, evaluations, it, it says not all not all entities are created the same, and I think that's that's definitely an improvement. Um, but it's interesting that it's true on both sides of the Atlantic, so it's an interesting one. Nadim, you're next on my list, and it says, can you provide examples? And they have not seen these questions ahead of time. They've had no chance to prepare. That's <laughs> not true. Can you can you provide examples of recent regulatory changes? that have had a significant impact on the payments and remittance industry, and how have organizations ad adapted to comply with these changes? Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's begin. We all re um, love uh, our regulators, and as part of their remit, um, they um, continuously um, adapt, implement new legislation, um, and initiatives. Um, obviously, post-COVID um, and the implementation of sort of operational resilience programs uh, where the, the focus had sort of increased and it was quite paramount, I think 2023 is also a year of gifts uh, for financial institutions. And the gift we have this year is the consumer duty. Um, so that is... Uh, regulation which has come in uh, as of the end of July. Um, and my theory or figures or uh, logic is that uh, a lot of firms are not ready um, for this. Um, 
and if they are aware of the uh, policy, um, it has not been implemented. So just a, a, a humble um, advice to please uh, contact your uh, advisors, third parties, uh, consultants, and to actually look into implementing that policy because non-conformance does come with it a, a lot of um, penalties. Um, now, what is the consumer duty? Effectively, it's about setting a standard where, or a, a higher standard uh, for consumers <coughs> to be able to uh, effectively have good customer support, which is relevant for them, uh, and when they require it. Um, another thing would be your products and services, and making sure that they are, it meets their needs, um, and that it's offered at a, a fair price value. Now, just to take maybe a step back, it sounds very, very generic. Um, at the moment, some of our internal policies and processes um, they're quite, in, in one sense, quite rigid. Um, imagine we have a vulnerable customer um, who's uh, initiating a transaction um, and or, uh, you know, somebody who's special needs. Does your customer services or your support or your communication uh, between your teams and that customer, is that actually available for them to benefit from? Are the products and services tailored to meet that vulnerable customer's needs? How are you identifying uh, vulnerable customers? So this is an interesting new approach um, I think the regulator has taken. Um, and for me, that is a bit <coughs> one. And I also feel it's one that we're sort of not ready for it in terms of maybe it's coming a little bit below the radar. Um, but yeah, absolutely, please do. Uh, investigate because I do think it's it's the big one for 2023. Great. I'm going to jump ahead to the next question unless you have a dying need to. JJ? I'm happy to add something there. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Rob. So just one regulatory change that I spotted recently that I thought was interesting because it, it demonstrated that um, regulatory guidance is increasingly accepting <laughs> of um, the benefits that technology can bring, regulations tend to be a little bit agnostic because they have to take account of face-to-face -face checks as well as remote checks. Um, but a, a month or maybe two months ago, um, the Joint Money Laundering Steering Group in the UK published um, an update to their guidance around impersonation fraud, and they explicitly called out the benefits of um, biometric checks being conducted where you as the regulated firm, you don't have visibility of the individual and their identity document sure. in front of you. Um, they already had impersonation <coughs> for guidance, but they explicitly added that um, statement, which is a recognition of the benefits that that technology can bring. So I think that's kind of interesting. Excellent. Yeah. Good point. OK. Well, JJ, let's continue. And since we're now BFFs, I can call you JJ instead of John. Absolutely. So. Please do. Um, what are the most common challenges that organizations face when it comes to maintaining compliance in the payments and remittance sector, and how can they overcome them? Okay. I think it's, it's the balance of you've got costs, you've got compliance, you've got the customer journey, and you're juggling all those different factors um, and trying to find the right balance. Cost is clearly critical, particularly you know, in, in low-margin uh, financial services. Um, perhaps where you don't even have repeat, the customer right. doesn't come back for, you know, to, to use your service again. So you've got to try and find that, that balance. You've got to do the right checks, you've got to be compliant, but without cost overwhelming yep. you. Yep. Um, I think you can sum it up. Um, it, it, for me, there's, there's, I, th I refer to it as the three Fs. Um, friction, frustration, and fraud. Okay. So I wasn't sure where. Yeah. So too, mu too much, too much, too much friction and frustration. Your customers won't use you. They'll go elsewhere. Um, but if you don't have sufficient friction, i.e., doing some checks, yeah. then you're going to be hit with fraud. Yeah. And it's balancing those those factors. Good point. Yeah. Ibrahim. Yeah. I mean, one thing which, uh, based on my own experience working with the startups, uh, they usually tend to rush uh, when they want to, you know, get into business and uh, they do away then with compliance or they do shortcuts, I would say. So that's not something which 
obviously is advice at all. Sure. You need to understand the regulations, you need to spend a lot of time really <coughs> understanding you know, the regulatory framework in which you want to operate. And then, of course, uh, take the right uh, you know, expertise on board, have the right resources on board, sure. and understand the market needs. You know, make sure that you, know, you have studied all the regulations governing your product and service offering before you jump into this space. You know? Because, yeah, it's always like, you know, uh, it's always good to look from the other side and things are like rosy. And, but then when you get into it, you realize right. that there's lots of stuff that's happening out there and you need to really ensure that you have the right tools. Sure. Yeah? Good. Nadine? No? Good? Good. <coughs> so, moving on to the topic, one of my favorite ones, de-risking. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I can tell you that in the States, um, it's been a problem for a number of years, and I'll get your perspectives. And certainly the problem that we had earlier in the year with Signature and Silicon Valley and, and others where basically they went down, and that caused the other banks who are normally friendly to money service businesses and, and global payment firms to modify what they, who they would accept. Some of them dropped out of crypto completely. Some of them went purely to B2B and no longer consumer um, uh, money transfer companies. And it, it, as someone who tries to help clients find bank accounts in the US, it, it's been a real challenge to adapt. Um, <clears throat> so I want to hear what it's going to be like uh, outside of the states and in, in, in the venues that you all serve. <clears throat> Nadim, this has, your, this has your name on it. but uh, So you get to start. But I have a feeling JJ and Ibrahim will also have some way in. So it's become a prevalent issue in the industry. Uh, so. It asks, what are the primary reasons behind financial institutions' decisions to de-risk, and how can payment service providers mitigate the impact of de-risking on their operations? I think we probably know the answer to the first, but I'd love to hear your point of view. But certainly, the guidance on how providers can, can mitigate that impact is, is critical, I think, for people. Yeah, so um, I think this is a question which is um, a, a, a firm favorite for, for, for these types of panel discussions. And it's going to be uh, an ongoing question for the foreseeable future. Um, I think when it comes to de-risking, um, the approach uh, from the banks um, or the methodology in, in, in their approach has not really changed. Um, the banks have to have robust policies in place um, and procedures uh, to be able to prevent uh, to be able to identify and to be able to report financial crime. Now, add to this mix uh, for financial institutions that engaged in cross-border uh, transactions, the ununiformed cross-border regulatory framework, uh, which also then creates challenges. Um, now, they have this on one side, and on the other side, uh, non-conformance would result in heavy financial levies. Um, it could reduce banks' uh, correspondent access. Um, and for some of them, it's about reputational damage. Now, they have all of this on one side. Um, and for them, I think it's the lesser of two evils. Um, I think uh, the banks would weigh it up and say, well, oh, hold on, let's look at the transactional volume, let's look at the commercial viability, and all of this, um, um, how do I say, it? high stakes. Um, and is it really worth? So, so they would then um, apply uh, maybe a full exit from the sector, which is it's just easy. If they're not dealing in that particular sector, then you know, they, they're, they're sort of protected in that sense. And there are some institutions um, that um, have limited exposure to this sector. They do exist. But then they would have extremely stringent criteria. They would want to make sure that they have accounts um, and they offer uh, payment services uh, facilities to more of the institutional level um, you know, of clients. Um, and those clients have the capital resources, the human resources. Uh, they would have the necessary internal controls. And then banks are uh, effectively uh, have the accessibility or clarity, and it sort of appeases their their appetite to that risk. And obviously, an institutional client would come with that amount of uh, sizable volume, um, and, and they would engage. Now, let's not talk about, I think, the, the, the depressing stuff. Um, let's talk about mitigation and solutions. Today, 
uh, we are in a much better placed uh, position in terms of we do have uh, payment service providers, we do have um, a, an amount of EMIs who do offer umbrella accounts or, or um, sub-accounts, um, client segregated accounts, uh, if I may say. Um, and they are onboarding uh, money transfer operators, small, medium, large, um, SPIs, APIs. Um, so, so that's, I think, something which we're seeing quite a lot of um, that we've seen quite a lot of recently. There are a number of fintech banks. Um, there are some European uh, banks which have also entered the space, um, and, and I'm generalizing in Europe, um, that have entered, and they are also um, onboarding uh, organizations from within our sector. Now, these uh, new entrants, they do have quite stringent onboarding policies and the commercial model has changed up a little bit. So nowadays you have um, the, the fintechs and banks, um, they request or they ask for um, onboarding fees and monthly fees, and they have these uh, various pricing models. So one would have to assess the commercial viability, um, obviously before engaging. But I think the point I'm trying to make is we do have a lot more than last year uh, in terms of solutions and options. So I think in terms of uh, the future, you know, it's, it's not as gloomy as it was, as, as it was sorry, a couple of years ago. Um, there was literally nobody and there was this um, mass panic. Um, for new entrants um, or smaller NTOs, uh, there's a lot of providers nowadays that are providing white label type solutions and uh, also flexibility in terms of sharing or consolidation of technology. Now, what does that do? That allows um, the new entrants or the smaller MTOs to sort of capitalize on that technology and to help them grow um, until such a stage where they can effectively go it alone. Um, so um, in, in that regard, there are a lot more, I think, options than we, we had previously. Ibrahim, anything else? Yeah, I mean, de-risking, I know, is a very sort of sensitive subject, and uh, it still exists. Uh, that's a fact, I know, across, I would say, uh, the world. And uh, it's just that some jurisdictions have been quite open to yes. discuss and address, and some jurisdictions have been quite closed. Uh, in the UK, for example, with the recent incident of you know, one account being closed because of PEP and because of some political views, there was an issue. It came up in the you know, various media. And then what happened was, of course, uh, you know, FCA had to lay down some guidelines on, you know, what are the sort of like, you know, what are the terms uh, based on which de-risking has to happen. Uh, so yes, I mean, it's, it's a collaborative, I would say, approach that has to take place between various uh, stakeholders uh, in the payment ecosystem. The regulator has to, you know, jump in into this, lay down the guidelines clearly on, on what basis, you know, the banks or the financial institutions are de-risking. And, and then, of course, through the industry, you know, forums, uh, this has to be raised. Uh, and, and, and I think there has to be a calculated risk-based approach rather than a blanket approach on saying, you know what, I don't, I don't need to deal with MSBs because each MSB has got its own, you know, uh, set of policies, procedures sure. might vary from the other MSBs. And again, it also varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So there has to be more tailored approach towards de-risking. I, I just, just briefly, and actually picking up on something that Ibrahim mentioned um, in, in the UK, um, there has been a tendency, and it goes back to, I think, when some of the, the newer sort of digital banks started, that they had a policy of not, on, not onboarding certain categories of customers, and certainly PEPs have absolutely <coughs> fallen into that category. Um, and yes, it, I think it's in part, of course, to do with the compliance risks associated um, with certain types of customers. But it's also the sheer cost of having those additional processes mm -hmm. to be able to onboard them. And I think it, rather than perhaps, you know, if we take the case of PEPs, you know, taking PEPs as just a single category and either say, well, we, we will accept them and we'll do whatever we need to do, or we perhaps won't. The politically Sorry, politically exposed, exposed persons, persons, yes. But, but taking a slightly more intelligent view of them and perhaps you know, looking at them by sector or by jurisdiction and, and kind of comes back to the risk-based approach, yeah. rather than saying PEPs inherently risky, we won't onboard them <coughs> at all. Um, and so, the, 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 in the UK again, you know, the FCA is is going out to doing a sort of consultation around how mm -hmm. 
the whole kind of PEPs piece should be managed longer term to avoid marginalising certain uh, yeah. sectors of the population. Okay. We're going to move on to technology. Um, not my area of expertise, but I can read the questions, so it's okay. So, and I think we're going to start with Ibrahim on this one. So, how can technology such as AI and blockchain, um, how can you leverage that to enhance the compliance efforts and address uh, this evolving, ever-changing regulatory landscape in payments and remittances? So, how do, how do compliance companies and, and regulators, et cetera, how do they, how do they leverage AI and tech, uh, blockchain to their to the best advantage. Yeah, so I would say AI definitely is something that is heavily utilized and, and it's still, of course, emerging. Uh, so when it comes to compliance, obviously right from onboarding all the way to you know transaction processing, AI is involved in every bit of it. Uh, so we all know that today, you know, if we just download any app and we want to onboard ourselves, we just do digitally and that's all possible because of AI. Mm -hmm. So there are various providers, you know, that help with the you know verification, authentication of various identification documents making sure that the person who is, you know, claiming uh, is a genuine person, sure. onboarded digitally, and then after that comes, of course, the, the monitoring part of it. And, and what's interesting with AI is, so with the normal compliance, standard compliance systems, we have the transaction monitoring rules, which are normally configured uh, as static rules. Mm. And, and then maybe there might be some which are dynamic, but then AI comes into picture where it creates much more sort of intelligent algorithms within it which allows you know, better transaction monitoring uh, capability within the systems. And so it's like helping the compliance function, basically, to say, hey, there is something unusual happening you know, with the transaction patterns, and how do you address it? So this is where the power of you know, AI and machine learning comes into picture. And of course, the fraud monitoring element also comes uh, uh, yeah, right. within the AI. So that, that's on the AI side. You know? uh, obviously, with the blockchain, uh, I personally am not a blockchain expert. What I can say is it is definitely something which is still in the early stages. Uh, I personally did not come across anything which is a widely used blockchain case in the space of compliance. Uh, yes, definitely as a technology, uh, it's quite uh, seems to be quite promising, but we'll have to wait and see still. Nadeem, you're the, you're the technical yeah. guy on this stage. I don't know how much time we have left, but yeah, favorite topic. Um, <laughs> So, look, blockchain, um, cryptocurrencies, um, digital wallets, um, sometimes uh, I think there is uh, the situation where they're operating in a little bit of a gray area. And, and why that is, is because of interpretation of regulatory law. Um, and it's always evolving, and that presents um, a challenge. Um, AI. Um, is also uh, something which um, is able to help us. And one of the main areas is uh, monitoring. So we often forget after sometimes onboarding on our digital applications, clients and customers, that monitoring is just as import as important as the onboarding piece. Um, so AI uh, creates great, um, I think, MI uh, for management to predict habits and to predict, uh, predict sort of trends. Um, and it's something which is very new. Um, it is evolving. Um, but in terms of, if we were to talk about sort of the highlights of the future and the evolution of payments, these are some of those, um, I, I would say, key areas where you're going to see significant growth. Um, Ripple. Um, so RippleNet um, offers some fantastic opportunities for um, our sector, um, again, quite new. Um, I do feel there's a little bit of an educational gap, um, but I know they are here somewhere. Um, and, and things like that do assist us when it comes to the liquidity on demand, um, execution of payments. Um, and what do these things do? Let's maybe be a little bit more direct and candid. They will reduce your processing costs. They will make your internal processes more efficient. And you'll save money. If you are able to save money, you're able to pass that on to the consumer. This then creates opportunities. Um, those opportunities allow us to leverage, uh, increase, and appeal to new markets, new customers. So look, if you can adapt and navigate these changes and embrace them uh, with an open mind, I think those would be the organizations that would be thriving um, you know, in the future. 
Um, and it is, like I said, that, that is the excitement for us, uh, especially over the next few years, in terms of how these things will be maturing and uh, materializing. But yeah, that's... JJ, I think... I don't think I've really got anything to add to all that. <laughs> You, I think you know a lot more about AI probably oh, yeah. than I do. I think we have no idea what it's really going to achieve in the, in the long run. It's, but it's honestly, it's exciting. limitless. Um, you'd actually be quite shocked. Um, so we, we've been experiencing um, and, and talking to a few um, entities, uh, and some of the stuff is amazing, things that you haven't thought of in, in terms of the AI, in terms of even the creation of suggestions. And if you want to have an agile compliance program in your organization, um, Actually, forget all of that. Chat GBT or GBT or BTG, Chat. whatever. I forgot the name, so I've gone, got dementia. Um, we have all used it for our presentations, you know. But it's it's the chat of of of, of our industry. Um, it's not that we don't have to learn or educate ourselves, but it's like previously when we had the abacus, and then there was the introduction of the calculator, <coughs> and we sort of naturally levitated towards it. Um, it's the same thing here with AI and the future of payments. Um, so yeah, we should embrace it, absolutely. It, it's interesting because it, it's a lead into the next, the, the word agile is, is very appropriate because we're talking about, let's say newer organizations, companies that are entering the global payments or remittance business. Um, and, and this can, uh, we can start with Ibrahim on this and then go to Nadim. Um, if you're trying to establish a robust compliance program and uh, just a plug for the remit one platform, it's an amazingly robust uh, platform in terms of the compliance control. So if you haven't looked at it, I recommend that you do. You're welcome, Harry. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> so if you're, let's say you're new in the entry or, or you're coming into a new country, how do, you, how do you, what are the best practices for getting a robust compliance program uh, that has to remain agile, to use the word, in this, ever-changing regulatory environment. Uh, Ibrahim. Uh, so it all starts first with understanding the regulations first. I'm sorry. Uh, it all understands with first uh, the regulations, you know, in which you are going to start first, you know, operating in. So understanding the regulatory framework, understanding what are the regulations governing the products and services that you are offering um, within that jurisdiction. And then, of course, you have to look out for systems that are compliant with those regulatory framework that are smart enough, I would say, in terms of providing you with the required uh, you know, capabilities in terms of onboarding, transaction monitoring, sanction checks, uh, and even fraud monitoring for that matter. Uh, especially if you are on the digital side, then obviously there's mm -hmm. lots happening on that space. So right. you need to have those also along with it. So quite often what we see is the focus is all on the AML and CTF part. But it's not, compliance is not just AML and CTF. It's much more than that. It's sure. like a comprehensive compliance of right. the entire business. So. And of course, it goes back to you know business-wide uh, risk assessment that you need to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you have done that, then only comes the the systems that you need to have in place. And and there are factors so there are right. which uh, enables you to choose you know the right automated solution uh, based on that. Sure. That you have Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Nadim, weigh in. You don't have um, to, but sorry, I forgot the. So if you can just repeat the question, I, I sort of was... Yep. Um, I'm sorry, what? Just so if can you can repeat, repeat the question. question. Oh, yeah. Yes, I sure can. So uh, sorry. I, I used it as an example of, of companies entering into the global payments from yeah. space, but it could be an existing company that's going into another country or another region, et cetera. What, what are the best practices to develop a robust compliance program and be agile in the shape of, face of ever-changing regs? Right. So um, for me, um, it's pretty simple. I think it starts with um, stakeholder buy-in. Uh, we have to have internally a belief system which starts right at the top of an organization mm. and then filters its way um, all the way to the bottom. Um, if that is not prevalent, it then becomes extremely... Uh, difficult because I think you mentioned <coughs> earlier on uh, the sales people don't like the compliance people, the compliance people don't like the operations people, and we're very fragmented, um, you know, in, in our little families <coughs> and, and organizations. So stakeholder buying for me is key. Um, after that, I think sometimes uh, defining goals and also attaching or connecting it to a term. So this is my goal, and I wish to achieve this goal. 
within this particular time frame. Um, that should be the very, uh, for example, the beginning. Um, following on from that would be having regular internal reviews whereby you can identify where you are at um, and what are the areas that one can improve in. Um, there's also uh, things, um, for example, uh, that we need to make sure that we have a competent compliance team um, and that they are open uh, to change um, and that they qu they're quite agile when, uh, for example, there is um, regulatory changes or, or new initiatives and that they're able to adapt. And we need to believe in that compliance team that they're able to deliver. Um, other things um, would also include training. So let's again ignore the fancy stuff um, and the AIs. Um, we have a first line of defense and that's our support guys, our treasury guys, the operational staff. Um, their training is key. That is something that has to religiously be done over and over again because they are the ones that will pick up uh, any threat um, at early stages and then be able to sort of escalate that up. So everything has to work in tan tandem. Um, I think implementing a compliance program is not just for uh, a compliance team. It's actually something which has to be obviously from uh, sort of end to end. Yeah, and I think you said the right thing. It starts at the top. Yeah. You know, management ownership has to buy Absolutely. in. Um, <clears throat> in the U.S., I don't know if it's a common term over there, but we talk about the four pillars of, of compliance, you know, which include you've got to have a qualified BSA ML officer. Uh, you've got to have your policies, procedures, and controls. Training. training, not just of the compliance team, but of the salespeople, anyone who's touching the customer information. And then finally, periodic independent testing, so it's the same thing. JJ, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, just a, a couple of points. Um, just picking up on the, the risk point, um, it's important to look at that, that, that risk issue from you know, the different perspectives of the risk inherent in your organisation, inherent in your customers, the particular products you're offering your customers, <coughs> the jurisdictions that you're operating in, and if, I suppose effectively build a matrix that sits across that yeah. to actually then define your risk-based approach. Yeah. And then yeah. when you've got that, you understand the regulations to the point earlier, you then need to look at the technology um, in the market to identify the right technology to address yeah. your compliance needs and your risk needs. And that, that's absolutely key. That phrase, pillars of compliance, do you use that over here? Is that purely a, a North American phrase? You can use it's it. It's not one that I particularly right. use. Well, I think you should adopt it. <laughs> um, That's the tip. <laughs> let's go over to you. Okay, so, um, oh, geez, it's a lot of words on here. Uh, okay. How do international regulations and anti-money laundering standards impact payments and remittances businesses, and how can cross-border compliance be effectively managed? Okay, so... You get different regulations, different regulations, different legislation, all those factors, of course, yeah. in different jurisdictions. But they all come down from the guidance that FATF issues at a global level. Yeah, right. So the Financial Action Task Force. So <clears throat> in reality, what you see in each individual country, each jurisdiction, isn't that different, even though some of the, uh, the ways they suggest you, you might comply right. may differ slightly. Good but point. you can kind of look at it as being relatively consistent globally. And if you're a, a firm that um, operates in multiple countries across the world, then you ultimately need a solution that will... Um, allow, allow, Sorry, I'll step back slightly. You don't want to deploy different solutions in every jurisdiction because that's so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you then need a solution that will meet your requirements on a global basis. So that might mean using, uh, say, um, a document and biometrics provider that's got a document library that provides identity, that holds identity documents for pretty much every country in the world. Yeah, right. Or, and then if you're looking at data sets, um, a provider that um, yeah, has data sets in multiple jurisdictions. Sure. So you then don't have to go shopping in every different place. Exactly. Which clearly has the cost overhead. Ibrahim, want to add? No. No, you're good? good. Nadim? No? Because right. you guys, you must have been a very good answer. <laughs> 
Um, okay. <laughs> says on my card, we're sticking with you for now. Um, so what role does customer due diligence play in modern compliance efforts, and how can organizations balance customer experience? Harriet, I really did read these ahead of time. This isn't the first time that I'm reading. I just want you to know that just there's a lot of words here. What role does customer due diligence play in modern compliance efforts, and how can organizations balance customer experience with the need for rigorous customer due diligence requirements? Well, how do you balance yeah. that? Yeah. Well, of course, customer due diligence is the heart of your compliance with your, reg your, your the regulations that um, you operate under. Um, and they're, again, at the heart of actually understanding who your customers are. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's part of your risk assessment, of course. So, again, it comes back to that balance between carrying out the checks um, in a compliant way, but not creating too much friction for your customers. So it's finding the right technology that allows a smooth, relatively frictionless onboarding yeah. journey for your customers. Mm. Uh, I mean, when it comes to CDD, uh, so we know that there is simplified due diligence, enhanced due diligence, basically, and right. it all depends on the business model of the company. And so let's say if we talk about the remittance mean, industry, I might be sending you know, transactions to high-risk uh, jurisdictions. So if the transactions are going to high risk, then obviously there has to be enhanced due diligence or, or relevant checks applied. Sure. Whereas if it's to a non-high risk yeah. jurisdictions, then obviously the due diligence level is lowered. You know, uh, So there has to be, of course, that sort of uh, customization or tailored approach. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, otherwise what will happen is it won't uh, uh, be convenient for the consumers you know, who sure. are doing business with you. So so there has to be you know, a, a sort of like uh, uh, approach towards what level of due diligence needs to be applied based on the product that you're offering uh, and based on where the transaction is being terminated. Uh, so if it's a cash pickup, for example, obviously there are certain checks applied. If it is to account, there are certain checks applied, right? So if you compare it between cash pickup and account transfers, account transfers are much more sort of kyc already because you sure. know the other end also has an account, Absolutely. whereas with the cash you need to have the additional due diligence uh, checks and controls. Yeah, um, yeah just maybe to, to reiterate what um, Ibrahim mentioned, SDD, or whether it's EDD, um, it really um, sort of varies uh, depending on um, your commercial model, the type of service, um, territorial risk uh, in terms of um, where you're operating from, where you're operating to, uh, where your cross-border transactions are pre predominantly being sent. Um, but um, absolutely, if you go with, I think um, uh, Jonathan um, mentioned earlier about the risk-based approach. Um, you have to apply that, um, and if that is implemented, you'll see that things would naturally um, actually uh, work in your favor in terms of um, implementing um, s sort of uh, internal robust uh, systems. Um, so yeah, it was just really to reiterate what Ibrahim mentioned. Good. Hey, Sajid, how much time are we supposed to leave for questions? Uh, about 10 minutes. Oh, only 10? Okay, so we're in good shape. Thanks for staying awake. So um, the next question, Nadim, we're going to go to you on this one. Um, are there specific compliance challenges or opportunities that arise when dealing with emerging payment technologies such as crypto or digital wallets? And I think this is a perfect question for you. Are there specific compliance challenges or opportunities that arise? Right. This is a, it's an interesting one. So we have challenges and we have um, uh, opportunities. Um, and again, it depends uh, which you would like to apply to first. So if we were to go down the um, chain or the, the, the blockchain uh, stroke cryptocurrency, um, some of the challenges um, that you face, and this is by, by nature of the asset. Um, so cryptocurrencies have this element of anonymity. Um, so from a compliance perspective, if you're trying to identify the UBO of that asset, you're going to have challenges. Um, the movement of uh, crypto assets, again, um, you're faced with the challenge of uh, cross-border payments um, and the, uh, I think, the uh, disparity in terms of regulation um, from 
<coughs> sorry, point of send to uh, point of receive. And that is because the nature of the asset is, is, is borderless. Um, so so those, those are some of the uh, challenges. Uh, in terms of opportunities, and I think we did maybe touch on it a little bit earlier, um, implementation um, of, of blockchain will definitely have um, a totally different perspective to the standardized way that we've been operating um, over quite a number of years. Um, in terms of your execution times, in terms of uh, your speed, uh, efficiency, um, your cost, um, operational cost. And again, that sort of creates an environment where you're able to expand uh, in, in terms of your customer uh, proposition and your offering. Um, and again, pass those savings on to the consumer. So that means we are leading to um, a time where uh, competition will uh, obviously increase. And at the end of the day, the consumer benefits. Um, now, from, from within the industry, I think the, the person or the entity uh, which is able to embrace um, the, um, sort of the blockchain stroke, digital wallet stroke, um, cryptocurrency piece, and, as, and navigate from a pl pl uh, compliance perspective the, um, the concerns by collaborating with uh, regulators, um, they will be um, the entities that sort of succeed uh, in, in the long run. Uh, because um, I think the way uh, we are seeing um, the evolution of payments, um, it's only a matter of time somebody can execute payments faster than you, cheaper than you, and if we're still on the SWIFT and the correspondent and the networking and this country doesn't operate on a Friday and it's, it's trade was done on a Saturday, that will die. Um, so there is definitely opportunities and it is the exciting factor for, for the future. Excellent. Yeah, I would just like to add uh, from regulatory perspective on the you know crypto. So, for example, in the UK, you know FCA has already you know laid down the framework in terms of crypto registrations. So it falls under the money laundering regulations 2017, mm -hmm. and uh, there are a set of of course conditions given. So if the business has got an interest here, has got consumer base, then obviously they fall under the you know the MLR 2017, uh, which was not the case. Uh, if you look a few months back. Uh, so crypto is definitely something which they want to bring under the regulatory framework. Now, because of the nature of the technology being anonymous, they still want to, you know, work around it and find out exactly, you know, how do they identify still the, the sending part and the receiving part, you know, yeah. and that's where something known as the travel rule, I'm sure maybe in US it has come, has been applied also uh, to, to identify the sender as well as yeah. the receiver of the transaction. One second. Yeah. What was that? You did a great job. <laughs> Uh, and it's time for questions. It says I get 26 minutes up here. Uh, it stopped. <laughs> I'm fine. I know I'm, I'm good. Unless JJ, did you? Can want I just to... yeah, just add one yeah. point? Yeah, yeah. Please. It's actually just picky. I was going to mention um, the FCA and, and crypto and so on, but I guess just that particular point. What that demonstrates is that increasingly crypto and fiat currency payments and transfers are being viewed by regulators very similarly. So, yes, as you say, we've got the AML regulations. We've now got the travel rule. Um, we've got regulations in the UK around promoting crypto. So, increasingly, firms are going to have to treat crypto in exactly the same way mm. as any other um, fun financial sure. payments product. Right, right. So, there's a desire <clears throat> somehow to bring it into the mainstream so there's some uniformity point of view. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah that's, that's, exactly. those are good observations. Um, so just so you know, there's three questions left here, and if you'd like to corner any one of these guys at the end, you know, you can ask these questions and they can do it. Because so, now I need to open it up to floor questions. And if you have a question, you have to wait for the microphone so the people listening, the millions of people around the world who are listening virtually can, can hear your question. So, yes, my favorite couple. Yes, please, Lindsay <laughs> or Mihai, whoever. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, my question is, uh, a top question we get from clients all the time is, OK, I'm entering a new market. I have the option to rent or borrow the regulation of a licensed bank or become regulated or buy a bank, right? Um, of course, the latter two are very expensive and difficult 
many prefer the option of integrating with a partner and using their license, which, and all of these options have pros and cons, and I'm wondering from a compliance standpoint and a long-term trend standpoint, if you all have a perspective on which is more advantageous. Anyone, who wants to start? Oh, should please. I go first? Please, yeah, please. Okay. please, yeah. Um, look, I, I think, um, Again, and, and this sort of maybe varies from, from person to person. Uh, maybe it's one of those questions that depends who you, who you speak to. Um, but I would sort of approach this by first looking at the territory I'm going in. How significant is it? Um, and absolutely, if I am able to um, go to market um, quicker by aligning or collaborating uh, with an existing player, and at the same time, really scrutinize the, the whole business model. Is the flexibility there for me to exit um, the relationship? Um, because technically, when you do go into collaborations, customer ownership is with the principal. So it's not with you. Um, so that would be my fear. Um, but I would definitely um, look to scrutinize that. How important is the market? maybe even do the collaboration and, and use it as a stepping stone while you have an application uh, which is in place. But we have to really understand, um, becoming regulated in, in today's world, we are in a, a heavily regulated industry and it doesn't really matter where you go globally because a lot of the frameworks that you'll see in different central banks or regulators, they're quite similar. Uh, yeah, they're in different languages and there's a few tweaks here and there. Um, but it is extremely difficult. Um, on the flip side, um, uh, if I had the money uh, and we have the financial capital and I have the uh, access to those human resources, absolutely, and if I'm able to wait. So you have to manage how quickly do I want to enter a market because you don't want to get um, stuck in undertaking all of the compliance stuff and then you know, there's Mr. Speedy Gonzalez, uh, money transfer, you know, who goes in within a week and he's doing everything you were going to do, but you're nine months behind because you're waiting for applications to go through. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, they both work. I don't think there's a right or wrong approach. It's just really you guys coming together internally and just giving it that <coughs> 360 overview. Um, and then obviously having uh, un unanimous um, internal um, decisions and then just go for it. Yeah, I mean, just to add to Nadeem, you know, for established players, uh, it's good to, you know, start on their own uh, because they are already established, they know their markets very well. But for those who are completely new, uh, then obviously it's good to take that out of being an agent. And, and so they, they can test the waters before they can start offering services directly. But obviously each one comes with its own pros and cons, you know. Yeah. It comes Do you down. Think that regulators look unfavorably at banking as a service model or I'm using someone else's no, nothing of that sort. Either. Definitely not. Look, um, banking as a service, you have to remember that these um, operations or processes or systems that are being used, um, they're quite mature and they are quite stable. Um, and it's already given regulators a chance to see performance. Now, if you are to compare that to something which is about to come in, and you can have the demonstrations and you can have you know, uh, the diagrams and the flows, you're still new, so in, uh, you know, if, if you were to compare the two, it's actually more favorable, favorable to, to, to take something. And it already has a mature uh, supply chain, so you'll have the banks integrated and et cetera, and those processes have already been approved. So absolutely, like sticking with banking as a service does have its pros. Um, that's, not to stay, that's not to say, sorry, uh, that you don't innovate by you know, trying to introduce your own. But again, let's go for the flexible approach. Can I create a front-end layer, um, use a, a banking as a service provider in the back, um, build my technology, and then just quietly move it over? I mean, that would be the, a logical, smart thing to do. Mihai, did you have... Hi, I'm Mikhail Popov. I work at PCMI as well with Lindsay. So my question is, what do you think about, uh, actually, do you think that MICA regulation will increase crypto adoption for payments? Do we think that... What was MICA it? regulation, market, uh, markets in crypto assets regulation from the European Union. Yeah, um, yeah I'm happy yeah. to start. Yes, I think, it, I think it will, because I think it will build confidence 
in the market. I think, you know, obviously, well, we all know how crypto started and where it's been and so on. But I think regulation, putting a, a rigorous framework around it, as we touched on earlier, will help to um, increase confidence, as I say, and that will help to drive adoption. So I think it's critical and, you know, and the equivalent happening in the UK and indeed in, in other countries. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to second that. Um, I think uh, in, in the evolution uh, process, um, you will see more and more acceptability uh, by regulators uh, globally. Um, and to some extent, you actually see certain jurisdictions uh, where there's this comparative competing going on. Um, so you could go to the likes of the Singapore's um, who are sort of, um, how do I say, closely watching uh, the Europeans. Um, and then we have the UK, which is sort of uh, independent of, of the EU in certain senses, but they are also trying to have their own initiatives. Um, so we do have uh, countries which are very pro-regulation uh, and pro-evolution and pro-acceptance. Um, but at the same time, um, you do have uh, certain countries which are completely closed off. Um, the likes of the Chinas, they're one of those ones that you could say have de-risked. Um, and that's probably, and this is a, a conspiracy theory, because they're going to implement their own blockchain national currency, whatever the reason is, I don't know. Uh, but there are people that are very mainstream, um, and, and I, I, I would actually agree uh, with, with that statement, that it will happen. It's only a matter of time. Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought you had That's a question. The mic man. He just gave you the <laughs> hot mic. This side of the room, here we go, over here. Uh, in the back with the pink tie, or magenta. I'm Mohammed Shami from uh, Tijari Wafa Bank. Well, uh, in your uh, appreciated intervention, you put a lot of emphasis on the, the new compliance model with regards to AI, blockchain, cryptocurrency. It would be interesting to, to know what is the strategies to put in place to mitigate the risk related to the risk in place. And just to note, we've only got a couple uh, of minutes. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Maybe. So, I, I think maybe so. There was an actual question uh, earlier on. I think you maybe uh, went for a, a toilet break. But yeah, we did we did go over this whole. Um, um, I, I think this, this question earlier on. Um, so in terms of de-risking, we have a lot more operation, um, options rather today than we did uh, this time last year. Uh, so you do have uh, several uh, EMIs. Uh, we have fintech banks uh, which have come in that are offering safeguarding, uh, client segregated uh, accounts and, and so forth. Um, and I think again, just recapping on, on, on this discussion earlier, uh, they do have complex onboarding requirements. Um, and then nowadays, uh, you are seeing different business models in terms of monthly fees, onboarding fees. Um, so the business model has changed. Uh, but I think one of the things that we have to remember is um, this is not what we were used to five years before. So banks are not necessarily going to be entering and opening their doors uh, to uh, financial services firms. It's going to be the rise of the fintechs. And that's also one of the primary drivers of why banks are exiting um, or declining in terms of their share of the market. Um, so it will be the fintechs that will be um, helping you to de-risk by offering you what previously you would have received from one of the tier one banks. Any last words? No, Ibrahim? just to add to the de-risking, uh, so basically it all uh, depends on the collaboration between different stakeholders, the <coughs> regulators working hand in hand with all the private sector, with all the industry bodies. Uh, that have got you know under them the you know the private uh, sector companies, uh, and this is where I think I believe uh, becomes a forum to discuss and debate and and find out ways uh, which can of course uh, you know address the the the, the area of de-risking today that's happening. So it's something which is still evolving. I would say still ongoing. Uh, there's no such solution as such on de-risking. There are alternative solutions which yeah. we mentioned, but obviously. Uh, we still have that challenge of this kingdom yeah. across the world. Any other final words, JJ? Yeah. By the way, Lindsay, I, I liked your question on partnerships because and I think Leon kicked it off this morning by talking about the, in his summary of points that that's coming. At, to me, it's the companies that maybe are a little undercapitalized in the beginning. Maybe it's better to outsource that. And obviously, there are a lot of companies whose that's their core strength. So certainly, if you care, my opinion is that partnerships are a good way to go for a lot of companies. I think we're out of time. But I think this panel is amazing, so let's give it up for them.
Thank you.